Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Bill Dwight. I'm a counselor at large and I'm the presiding officer for legislative matters, the subcommittee for, of the city council. I'm here with George Kohout, who is uh, chair of the planning board. This is a joint hearing um, of legislative matters and the planning board. And it should be noted that the planning board is the group that's actually gone out of their way and met us at, at our meeting point. And I'm, and I'm extremely grateful. We were actually seeing a lot of each other lately because there's a raft of uh, zoning changes that uh, are timely and need our attention. And as such, we, uh, to facilitate the process, we, we were having a joint hearing. This is a public hearing, and if, but we're gonna start off, um, let me describe form here a little bit. We're, we're going to pretend that we're framed in a legislative matters meeting and in which the hearing will be contained. In legislative matters, as council subcommittee, we, are, we have a period of public comment, which means you don't need to speak to issues on the agenda. However, when we come to the hearing, and, and for, let me preface that by for public comment, we'd ask that you just keep your comments uh, and remarks to three minutes. Identify yourself when, when you're called on. Um, leave your camera off if you can until such time that you're called and then or actually have the floor. And the reason for that is it makes it much easier to navigate this Brady Bunch screen for us so that we know who actually is a voting member and who isn't. Um, so, so you may speak during public comment, which is the next thing that's coming up. For the hearing, however, that's different. The hearing, you can only speak to the items that are listed in the hearing. Um, if you have thoughts about zoning in general, or you're really excited about the weather or whatever, that would be an inappropriate discussion point because that's not on the agenda of the hearing. It's not the point of the hearing, and it would actually be a violation of Massachusetts general law. And we don't want to go to Massachusetts general law jail or whatever that require, whatever that involves. So, um, so we'll preface it with, <laughs> we're going to open uh, by having um, public comment first. And if anyone's interested in speaking, if you could indicate by uh, using the raised hand feature. And if you're, depending on how you're accessing Zoom, uh, either by your desktop, laptop, iPhone, there's, there's a myriad of ways in which to do it, but it's usually for most folks, it's in the, in the general dropdown menu, am I right? Councilor Shara, because I'm doing this on an iPad. It's completely different for what people are doing on their on their desktop. But there is a so, drop down menu where you have some yeah, options. If you click on participants at the bottom of the screen, a participant panel will open and raise hand will be at the bottom of that. Or it um, some it depends on what version of Zoom. If you look under reactions, there could be a raise hand feature under reactions. And if you want for this purpose, since we don't have that many people here, actually, you can turn your cameras on and simply wave your hand in front of the, in front of the camera and we'll, we'll do the old school way. So is there anyone who would like to speak for public comment? Hmm. Well, that, that simplifies matters considerably. I'm gonna pause just a little bit, anyone? Okay, all right. All right, next in the uh, in our whiz bang agenda, we, we're gonna have a roll call. So sit back, this is pretty exciting. Laura, if you could call the roll of both committees, please. Okay. Councillor Dwight. Here. Councillor Shara. Here. Councillor Mayori. Here. And Councillor Thorpe. Here. Okay, and now for the planning board. Um, member Kohout. He's waving. Okay, which... sorry. <laughs> um, member Elkins. I don't think she's present. She's not here. Member Fowler. Here. Member Granat. Here. Member Taylor. Uh, no, he's not, not present, I'm assuming. Uh, uh, member uh, oh, he's um, coming in right just now. came in. Okay. Uh, member Tate. Here. Member White. Here. And member Whitehill. Not present. Okay, very good. Um, sorry, Laura. 
So member Taylor might not have been able to unmute before, so you might need to ask again. Oh, um, member Taylor, are you present? Yes. Thank you. Okay, well, there, there is certainly a quorum of mm -hmm. uh, planning board and the full body of legislative matters as defendants. So I may open this meeting and the hearing, but first, um, if you'll bear with us, we have some process issues to deal with. Uh, the first item for the legislative matters group is the uh, approval of the minutes of the previous meeting from January 14, 2021. And then also we have the minutes from February 8, 2021. That both of those were the joint uh, planning board and legislative matters hearings. Um, is there a motion? Move approval as a group. Second. Second. Discussion on the minutes? Laura, please call the roll. Member, uh, Councillor Dwight. Yes. Councillor Shara. Yes. Councillor Mayori. Yes. And Councillor Thorpe. Yes. Um, and George, I don't, uh, I don't know what your process is on minute approval, but do you want to wait for your next meeting or you want to do it here? I think we'll wait to next we need to do both, all of our minutes thank you very good okay um all right so now this is now we have a public hearing on proposed zoning changes um this is for mass general law chapter 40a section 5 a legal notice was published in the daily hampshire gazette, gazette on february 22nd 2021 and on march 1st 2021 um i'll spare you reading the public meeting notice First up, we have um, item 20.181. This is an ordinance relative to affordable housing. And the history on this is it was referred to the community resources, legislative matters and the planning board on January 7, 2021 with a positive recommendation from the community resources. Uh, that was back on, that, that was on the 23rd of February. And then the joint planning board legislative matters committee hearing scheduled today, 3-8-21. Um, if now we actually have a number of items and I, we did, we did last time was we, uh, we have two items here. So last time what we did, which was even more, we had more complicated process this time. I think it's appropriate to have Carolyn introduce to us both items. And that would also be 21. Point one eighty nine. that's an ordinance to create an incentive for smaller houses by allowing two half-scale units to count as a single family for density purposes. The, and first of all, I would accept the motion to open the public hearing. Move to open the hearing. Second. A second. Okay, discussion on opening the public hearing. Laura, please call the roll. Councillor Dwight. Yes. Councillor Shara. Yes. Councillor Mayori. Yes. And Councillor Thorpe. Yes. All right. So the public hearing is convened. Uh, George, you want to call your people? Uh, I Sure. Um, we have uh, Jenna White. Yes. Melissa Fowler. Yes. Chris Tate. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Yes. Yes. Krista go. Granat. Yes. Sam Taylor. Yes. Just open the meeting and the chair, George Coward. Yes. I think that's all, all right. of us. Yeah. Okay. So the hearing is convened. Um, so usually what we do is we have proponents present and discuss, and then we have either people who are neutral or opponents to speak as well. Um, and there, is, there will be an opportunity to ask questions and explore this. Uh, the, the members of the bodies can ask questions. Also, the public is welcome to ask questions. But let's start with Carolyn, and it's all yours, Carolyn. Thank you, Councillor Dwight. So tonight um, in front of you are, are, is the public hearing for two um, um, ordinances. And it, I will um, go ahead. I've got a short presentation to go over um, um, 
the uh, basic parameters of, of each one, and then we can um, go back and ask questions individually. If you have questions about, um, you wanna go into more detail or um, if you have specific questions um, um, on, you know, if you wanna focus on one um, as opposed to the other. So uh, can you, does everybody see the screen here? Um, with a, okay, great. Uh, so again, the, so I'll, I'll take these are sort of the, the order that they were in the um, advertisement. There's an affordable housing um, incentive ordinance 20.181. Um, and um, so this is a familiar slide to you all probably by now, but I just wanted to re-familiarize um, you with this and, and the relationship of the planning process and the zoning. Zone, zoning is one type of tool that we use to implement planning. And we've had a lot of, a series of planning processes for the last 10 years that have um, directed how we adjust and tweak the zoning regulations or the land use regulations in order to achieve um, some of the policy goals and objectives in those plans. And um, right now we're focused on uh, housing. We have had as, as the plans have identified and other studies have um, shown there's a there's a gap in our housing um, um, inventory, and it runs through the whole range of housing types, from um, smaller units to larger units, more um, accessible units to meet people across various income levels, and um, as well as affordable housing that's um, uh, for the most part subsidized housing. So the two um, items that we're gonna talk about today are affordable housing and incentives for smaller units. And it's all part of the strategy to try to um, achieve greater housing options and opportunities to allow for what we're referring to as attainable housing. The two family by right zoning, you all had the first reading in council last Thursday. So that's moving forward. Um, and so now we're gonna um, have these other, talk about these other two ordinances. So how do these all fit together? The idea is that the reason why we're doing um, or we're presenting the ordinances and the mayor sponsored the ordinances for bonus densities for um, deed restricted affordable housing is to try to further address the equity issues in providing more affordable housing that's really targeted for people of certain income um, brackets. And we wanted to lower the cost. The, the whole point of that this ordinance is to lower the cost burden of creating affordable units. So when it's typically a, a nonprofit like Valley Community Development Corporation or Habitat for Humanity um, evaluates what the um, path of least resistance for developing an affordable housing project is, um, sometimes they run up in, um, into barriers or um, um, steps that require um, or result in a longer um, processing time. And then that adds to the cost of either carrying costs or other costs that they might have. So this ordinance is, is um, focused on trying to lower those burdens and um, in particular address some of the costs related to the Department of Housing and Community Development processes for approving, um, that are typical for approving affordable housing. In terms of the half scale units um, in urban residential B and C, the idea is to address um, um, equity as well by providing smaller units that can be more affordable. We heard a lot about that during the two family process, two family, um, public hearing process and um, the concern about um, large um, units coming on the market and not being accessible to, to um, a sector of the community. So this is really to try to get at that um, piece of the market, um, lower the median price in, in housing uh, and really focus additional housing opportunities around the urban cores, which is why this is tailored to urban residential B and urban residential C. 
Um, and so it's it's really the half scale units, as I'll go into later, are, are defined as 800 square feet, which is more than half of what the median single family home size is now. So that's where we came up with, uh, or how we came up with the term to address that. So going um, into the details for the affordable housing incentive um, ordinance, it's an introduction of what, uh, another way to look at it is an introduction of a local 40B process. And 40B is a state, um, um, a state um, housing um, incentive program, I guess, if you will, to um, encourage the development of targeted affordable housing. But it has um, it's laden with um, various steps that can really create um, burdens for developers who are coming forward in the process. Um, the uh, we've had. Um, the other thing about 40B uh, throughout the state is that the state has established a threshold of desired uh, affordable housing units for each community, and that's a 10% uh, a threshold for um, that, that communities should try to achieve as their percentage of affordable units compared to all the units within a municipality. And if communities fall below that 10% threshold, um, any developer anywhere could apply for um, waivers from local zoning uh, for the purposes of creating um, higher density housing that includes affordable, affordable units and local, um, town cities and towns sort of lose control of the ability to um, dictate how that where how and where that housing is developed if they don't meet those that 10 percent threshold at the state level and if local governments turn uh, those projects down the appeals process goes up to the state housing appeals board so it's really sort of taken out of the local control when you don't maintain that 10% threshold. Northampton has maintained a 10% threshold for many, many years. We're just over 12%, I think, of our housing stock. Um, and we still know that's not enough. Um, and so the 40B projects that we have um, had approved in the city through the zoning board uh, have been what we refer to as friendly 40B projects in that we work with the developers. Developers aren't trying to come in and, and jam housing down the city's throat per se, but um, it, the opposite is true. And we're, we're, we work with uh, nonprofits, Valley Community Development Corporation and Habitat to uh, develop those in a way that meets the goals for both the city and the developer. So there's an example here on the right-hand side of Valley, uh, on the upper right corner valley cdc built this project at the end of um fort um, street right at the um, edge of the park um there um under the bridge and downtown and that process required them to go through the state um, review process and it took quite a long time to get their permitting the lower picture shows Habitat for Humanity um, units that were built by under the 40B process at the state level. So we've had projects in the city that have gone through this process. And so what we're proposing is to have a, a more streamlined process that's a, a local review and allows developers to come through to the planning board instead of the zoning board to um, get waivers from particular elements of the zoning. And in this case, in particular, um, allowing additional housing units um, up to two and a half times what would be normally allowed in the, in the underlying zoning and up to 60% reduction in frontage, depth and width um, for parcels that would otherwise be allowed in projects that weren't um, resulting in the creation of um, affordable housing. But the catch is that these, these waivers are really only allowed if you're going to be developing at least 50% of the units as dedicated for affordable housing over either a 30 year period for home ownership units or 99 year period for rental units. And that these units get to count at the state level 
uh, towards the city's overall calculation of affordable units so that those get into that 12% um, tabulation that the, um, we track and the state tracks um, uh, for us. The other piece of this is um, also a requirement that uh, permanent energy, energy sources shall be grid sourced or, or supplied from on-site electric, so solar, on-site solar, uh, or for, um, electric um, heating and thermal loads. And then the other sort of relief valve um, would be to um, related to significant tree replacement on the property so that uh, if the applicant uh, it triggers the replacement requirements for significant trees, that uh, the applicant do everything they can do to replace those trees on site, but if they can't quite meet the formula on site, they do it to the extent possible and the planning board review that. And then the remaining trees, if they haven't been able to make those up on the site, would um, um, not need to be replaced by paying into the tree fund, for example. And that's just another way to relieve some of the pressure on affordable housing developers that they don't have to um, continue to add expense to their projects um, through this mechanism, but that we get some tree replacement. Um, moving to the half scale unit ordinance. This is um, an incentive, again, as I said, to, so, to um, encourage smaller units. And essentially, it's a two for one unit count in the URB and URC districts. So half scale units would be defined as 800 square feet or less. And um, that would be applicable in the by right, the site plan and the special permit categories. So if you um, could either could do a two family on a property, but instead you chose to do all small units, then you could do four 800 square foot or smaller units. You'd still have to meet the same open space requirements and the parking requirements um, and the setbacks and all of that. But um, instead of say two 1700 square foot um, units, you could do four um, 800 square foot units. So again, the heat and thermal loads um, uh, equation that we've uh, started to incorporate into these zoning changes would be applicable here as well. So for new construction, um, those would have to be fossil fuel free. Uh, and then just to pull up the zoning map again, hopefully this is big enough for you to see, but again, for the for the affordable housing um, ordinance, that would be applicable throughout the entire city. So it's not zone based, whereas the half scale uh, zoning provision or proposed zoning provision would only be applicable to the URC, which is this orange area surrounding um, downtown um, uh, Northampton or the um, lighter orange that is urban residential B that's beyond the URC and goes out and surrounds Florence Center. And that's it for my presentation. Bill, you're muted. You did, Bill. All right, Councillor Dwight, you're muted. Thank you for that call. Are there any members of the public who are interested in speaking in favor of the proposed uh, zoning ordinances that we have before us? Anyone? Okay. Uh, all right. Anyone interested in speaking in opposition? Okay. All right. <laughs> Well, then I will, I will turn to, while keeping the hearing open, I'll turn to the members then. Uh, questions for Carolyn uh, from the planning board or from legislative matters? Questions or remarks? Oh boy. Well, I'll start, how's that? Oh, okay, I actually, JT, go for it. Thank you. And thank you, Carolyn, for that. Just one question. 
You mentioned earlier that um, Northampton were above the 10% threshold, which is good. And if we were to fall below that 10% threshold, uh, developers could bypass um, certain requirements and come in to develop. Is there a threshold then for them as to how many affordable units, a percentage that they have to have um, in their development? Sure. So um, the, for a state 40B process, the requirement is um, between 20 and 25% of the units being proposed in a project have to meet the affordability um, um, allowances for people who meet um, 80% um, or below the area median income. Those are the income, those are considered the income eligible people to either rent or purchase those units. So 20, um, about 25% of those units um, are required to meet that. In the ordinance proposed um, here, uh, that would be the sort of the local version of that, uh, we're uh, um, proposing 50% of the units. Um, meet that income eligible requirement. Okay, thank you. Chair Koha. Um, <clears throat> Caroline, thanks for the presentation. The last slide where I think you listed six incentives. Um, I, I, I didn't quite see how all of those were incentives. Um, I, could we pull that up just for one second to make sure I'm understanding it correctly? Sure. And I'm let sorry. me just clarify, they weren't considered to, they weren't necessarily incentives. They were just components of the ordinance, but um, okay. let me pull that up again. We've uh, often been talking about how to incentivize, you know, this uh, affordable housing, attainable housing zoning and. Right. Um, so, oops. Yeah. Um, let me right just, I can just put that into the slide. Oops. It's not popping up on my screen as the okay. slideshow. <laughs> uh, let me see if I can expand that. that. <laughs> no, I, I, I think we can see it okay, whoops. What a techie. So can you see that okay? That's I can't good. tell. That's good. Okay. So I can definitely uh, see number one, the two bullets there up to 250% of density and 60% reduction in frontage, et cetera. Um, yep. Be the second point two, 50 percent of the units must be deed restricted for 30 to 99 years. Do we have anything on the zoning books right now around deed restrictions and affordable housing? Yes. Yeah, so currently um, there are there are various uh, regulations already in our zoning that allow the planning board to um, create say waivers from the subdivision regulations if affordable housing units are constructed um, or um, there had been, there are other incentives in the zoning that um, have that component. And so on our definition of um, affordable housing, it's very specific actually, it was 99, there was a 99 year requirement for uh, many years until maybe four or five years ago, we tweaked that to specify that the 99 year restriction would hold for rental units as opposed to ownership units, in which case we changed it to 30. So that's currently in our definition of what an affordable housing unit is. And that, how, that matches up with what the state looks for when it approves um, affordable units to go onto what's referred to as the state's subsidized housing inventory, which is used to calculate the um, cities and towns um, affordable housing uh, benchmarks. Okay, thank you. Um, and in number five, you use that term relief, which makes a lot of sense to me. You know the developer gets relief from perhaps an onerous tree replacement cost. That's great as an incentive. But number four, as we discussed a couple of weeks ago and a month ago, some people see this as a little bit 
more onerous, um, having to provide electricity, having to provide all of their energy sources, you know, to be non-fossil fuels because of the cost. So the incentive is when, by providing that, by um, acknowledging that that's how the construction will work, then the real incentive is that they don't have to go through the process of this, um, this letter, the site eligibility letter, right. correct? Right. Okay. Which can um, often take a lot of time. And yes, you know, we've taught, we talked to um, sort of the two um, most frequent um, players in um, our world for health, affordable housing development are, are Valley CDC and, and of course um, Wayfinders has done some um, housing development in, in the city as well, but also Habitat. And um, the, all of these groups are moving towards net zero construction and, and um, so they don't see this as um, overly burdensome. They're building from the ground up typically. They're not doing renovation. So renovating buildings um, has, um, has different complications and, and potential expenses to try to get to those, um, that same level of um, efficiency versus when you're building new construction, you're buying all the infrastructure, the, the heating systems, the water systems, and um, so it's not, um, you're gonna have to expend uh, for those anyway. Okay, thanks. So I have a better understanding of the whole kind of package now in that language. It was just that word incentive that threw me a little bit. <laughs> Good. Okay. Uh, Solicitor Seawald has his hand up and then Councilor Shara. Good evening, everyone. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Alan Seawald and I'm the city solicitor. Uh, I just want to add a, a couple of points uh, to the discussion. With regard to the, uh, to the small structures, the multiple structures, I just want to be clear on the record that you know, these structures would either have to be held in common ownership uh, or they would have to be um, subjected to the condominium statute in order to separate the ownership. So these are not structures that can be separated into uh, single family homes for um, uh, in separate ownership. And I just, I just want that to be clear. Um, the other, uh, the other uh, point I wanted to make and add to the, to the record is with regard to the affordable housing uh, initiative. Under the state law, uh, one of the main features of the comprehensive permit statute is that the zoning board issues all local permits in one fell swoop. And um, that also distinguishes uh, this process from the state process, because without uh, special legislation, we couldn't have a uh, the local board, be it the planning board or the zoning board, issuing all of the permits for the project of every department in the city. And so um, if, um, and, and to, to answer, and also um, if, the, if the city were to fall behind below the 10% threshold, then um, the state would have the right to issue a permit if uh, the city board, the zoning board declined to issue it um, and could overrule any uh, conditions that were deemed to be uneconomic. And so uh, staying over the 10% is really key for the city in order to maintain our authority locally and to uh, make judgments locally about affordable housing. But I just wanted those distinctions to be on the record, particularly the fact that this is not a comprehensive permit process and it couldn't be a, pro a comprehensive permit process without uh, state legislation. Thank That's you. That's all I have. And Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and, and actually, while I have you here, and, and Council Chair, bear with me for a second, but we keep using this term affordable housing, and that is a Rorschach test for virtually anybody who projects whatever they think affordable housing is. But there actually is a defined standard, and if, if if, if either you or Carolyn could share that with us now so that we're all understanding exactly what it is we're talking about. Sure, I can do that. Um, right, so this really is the defined 
um, term in the zoning um, for affordable housing. And um, it is um, a housing unit um, that's affordable for those who are uh, making 80% of the area median income uh, for Northampton. And so it could be anyone in the income brackets that are, you know, 80% or below the um, median income. And that um, area median income is calculated by HUD and we're actually part of the Springfield um, area. So we get wrapped into that calculation. Um, but this, um, and our zoning goes further to say, and they must be deed restricted to be um, affordable for that 30 year, 99 year term, you know, ownership versus rental. And uh, affordability tracks as it changes. So if right. income levels, right, okay. So obviously, Wellesley and Longmeadow have a different standard for affordability than Northampton Springfield. No, I don't they think still, so. It's still focused on the area median income. Wellesley's area median income is going to be calculated differently, but it's still the 80%, 60%, you know, and on down. Right. Um, no, I, Long, I, I, I'm sorry, go and, ahead. And, and Longmeadow would probably be in the Springfield region right. as well. We're all in the same region. Okay. So, you know, we're, so it's regional. It's not city by city, town by town. Okay. And, um, you know, the other, the, the other part of this that uh, Carolyn uh, didn't, um, didn't, I don't think alluded to is that um, this is ha going to have to go through some process at the state because they're going to have to approve what's called a, a LIP, local initiative program, so that uh, there is some, and, and what we're doing in, in this proposed by uh, ordinance amendment is to provide uh, incentives, zoning incentives that constitute the, the sort of the local uh, subsidy, quote unquote, for the project uh, in order, under 40B, in order to qualify for inclusion on the inventory, there has to be subsidies. And we saw, you know, subsidies at the state level and the federal level in, in the large projects that we've seen. Um, but these are completely local subsidies in the form of zoning uh, incentives. And so that's essentially what we're doing. And that's the only way that we could get these included in the inventory is to provide some local incentives. Right. And actually on that note, coming out of community resources where there was a conversation and actually Laura Baker from Valley Community Development Corporation was there to um, uh, suggest that a modification be made to the language that doesn't just say projects have to go through the LIP process in order to get, um, you know, put onto our um, uh, subsidized housing inventory, but um, suggested that any other kind of state funding that goes into a project would um, provide a path to uh, um, putting those units on the state housing inventory to, to give an option for those developers to either go through the LIP process in order to have the units counted on our um, subsidized housing inventory or to show evidence that there's some other um, Commonwealth funding that requires those units um, to go into the state um, uh, subsidized housing inventory. Thank you. Uh, mm -hmm. Councilor Shara and then Councilor Jarrett. Um, Carolyn, do either of these affect the seven plus unit URB URC zoning that we passed a few years ago? Um, so it, the, um, it allows the, the um, I guess both of them, the answer would be both uh, possibly. Um, the way the, um, the affordable housing um, um, process or zoning is basically a one-stop shop with um, planning board site plan approval. So if um, an applicant were interested in creating 50% of its 
their units as affordable, they could potentially go through and um, build a request to build, you know, let's say 10 units um, through site plan instead of going through the typical um, special permit process. And so that, that would affect it in that way for that ordinance. For the half scale, um, the special permit triggers would still be applicable, but it would be for twice as many units essentially. So instead of seven units being the trigger, it would be 14 half scale units. And sort of uh, following up on what um, Solicitor Seawall had suggested before that these units need to be in common ownership or, um, or um, under a condominium association. We, you know, currently uh, there aren't, you know, people, someone might come in for a project on a single parcel for seven units and they're gonna max out at seven units, let's say, because of the minimum lot size. So there's no incentive for them to build smaller units. The, it's really, um, the zoning is set up to say, well, get as much as you can for those, um, seven units because that's all you're allowed to do on your property. Um, so this zoning is really targeted for those situations where someone might be doing a multifamily housing project and um, doesn't have any kind of incentive to build smaller units, which we know there's a market and a demand for. And we also know that smaller units are much more accessible to many more people than sort of these large units. Oh, so this has actually great potential to impact that. Impact. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it probably oh. depends on the parcel and, and um, right. And, and, you know, the idea actually has been floating around in, in discussions within um, our office and with the mayor's office for a while, sort of going back to um, development proposals in, I think it was a URB, where we were told that the, the developer really wanted to do smaller units, but there was nothing, they, they're not gonna get as much out of it if they do smaller units, because they're still boxed in by the cap based on the unit per lot size um, calculation. Okay, great, thanks. Councilor Jarrett. You're, you're muted. Uh, can we unmute Councilor Jarrett? Thank you. Um, uh, Carolyn, I have a question. Um, would this allow, if the affordable housing um, change, would this allow currently non-buildable parcels to become buildable? Um, potentially, yes, if you can, if, yes if waivers could be granted um, for frontage and lot size, then um, yes, it has the opportunity to, someone would have the opportunity to take advantage of that. So and those waivers would be granted by the site plan approval? Um, the planning which board. Section, right. the, in B, section B, right? So right. we could see um, if someone, didn't have the frontage, but had enough uh, size, that would be one possibility. Or just if, since it says there are no minimum, no other minimum lot size requirements. So you could conceivably have a parcel that's under that, under the current minimum up to 250% smaller than the current minimum. I, mean, I don't know. You wouldn't be able to fit right. many units, but uh, right. probably right. Maybe one or you know two more, maybe or something. Then, yeah. but the the um, well, I'm sorry. Go ahead and finish. I, I was going to respond to your question about frontage. Um, uh, no, go ahead. Uh, so the under item two, there's a requirement that there's at least a minimum of forty percent of what's. Uh, required in, in the underlying zoning, so you couldn't have no, you couldn't have zero frontage. So the parcel would have to have you know forty percent of what would normally. And we came up, we used that number because we have um, that um, 
sort of threshold number in another section of the ordinance when an applicant is um, dedicating land for open space to the city, the planning board can get, grant a reduction of frontage or lot size down to at least 40% of what would be required of a parcel um, for the purposes of allowing um, uh, the land dedication. So uh, that's where that 40% came from. So there's still a, you know, a portion of of the requirement um, that would be in place. Thank you. Are there <clears throat> any, any other questions? We're still in public hearing. No, no nobody. And this is anyone, it doesn't have to be the members, it could be anyone who, who has a question or a thought. Well, I take some solace in that. George, is your hand back up? Yeah, okay, go ahead. Here's Bill. Um, so the great thing about Zoom is some, we can multitask a little bit. I just did a quick web search on other tiny house communities. And Carolyn, I, it doesn't seem like there's any models kind of here in the Northeast, I might be wrong, but there are some other models around the country if people wanna look at you know, places where seven, 10, 15 tiny houses are built. Some were for, uh, a couple were for veteran projects, I think, um, for housing for veterans. Um, but uh, correct me if I'm wrong, is there anything around here that we could point to a community that's done a cluster of tiny homes? Um. Well, I guess a cluster of tiny homes with this kind of incentive, I don't know of in Massachusetts. Um, around the country, there are um, cities that have done um, micro units. And um, so that's a reference to much smaller units. Usually 350 square feet is the largest. Um, but yes, so there are other, there's, um, you know, Seattle, I think Portland, New York City, um, I think even Chicago have, have um, um, used or incorporated that into some of their uh, development review um, projects. So 800 feet is a pretty big, tiny home. Right. Okay. Right. It's and for it's the Northampton uh, scale <laughs> of tiny home. <laughs> Um, but all I guess I would say the reason we got to 800 is, you know, going back and looking at that median um, um, size um, house in Northampton and um, knowing that um, it really is sort of half of that, but it allows people with, you know, that might not be single, maybe they have, you know, other family members or household members that would be living with them. So it, it provides a bit more space in the context of, you know, our community. I'm sorry, I cannot figure out how to raise my hand with this. Okay, thing. well, Sam, I'll get you next, or Jana's next, and then um, we'll, and then you. How's that? Great. And then Council Maori. Thank you. I just wanted to um, sort of make a comment about the tree replacement piece of this. Um, which is to say that I'm glad to see carried over. I mean, obviously we have um, a part of the existing tree replacement ordinance allows for, for waivers for um, projects that have other kinds of benefit, for example, net zero or affordable housing. So we're seeing that sort of carried over here. The part that gives me a little bit of pause is the replacement on site to the extent possible. Um, just to say that that's, I find kind of very hard to actually evaluate and enforce particularly when we're looking at the scale of even existing projects that have come before the planning board. And if we're looking at projects that could be, you know, two and a half times larger than what we've currently seen, figuring out, oh, is there a different way that we could configure this? Or we commonly hear from the public, you know, well, you could just make it a little bit smaller and then you could save this precious tree. Um, so I think that that's, you know, an existing tension in sort of implementing that part of 
um, the ordinance. So I'm not necessarily suggesting we shouldn't have it, but maybe over time we can think of more um, creative or direct ways to ask for better information from applicants about how to address that particular point so that we as the board and members of the public can feel confident that other alternatives were considered um, to either you know, save significant trees or to really put it that good faith effort of replacement um, in place. Thank you. Uh, Member Taylor. Um, a couple things. One, I'm uh, the 800 square feet thing is, uh, honestly just seems very and just too small and almost like I, I'd like I'd like to see our development focus more on families and bringing more families into into uh, Northampton um, and versus just elderly and and single people um, and. You know, 800 square feet is just is just too small. I mean, I'm not saying you know. I think a thousand square feet, 900 square feet, as someone who owns a couple 850 square feet places, um, it's uh, it is very, 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 very tight for a modern for a modern family, and um, I just think that it could be expanded to allow for you know, if the goal is to have, at least in my mind, when, as, as we were saying before, we, we all, when we hear uh, uh, affordable housing, we, we all see different things, but I see affordable housing as meaning a family can move into our, our area and, um, and, you know, bring, bring all of the things that they bring with them. Um, and take advantage of our schools and all that kind of stuff and, and grow in our community. And I just don't see that with 800 square feet. Um, and then I, I guess I'd also like you to talk if you could about the parking situation. It seems like if you have four 800 square foot units there, you don't, you have more than four cars. So, so Carol and I, I basically, uh, between Jenna and Sam, I heard a couple of points that okay. probably need addressing, so. Sure. So um, I'll start from last and go to Jana after. Uh, so the, you, you know, the um, 800 square feet is not meant to address all the housing needs. Um, because um, a, as um, I described at the beginning, we've got this sort of multi-pronged approach to try to encourage a whole lot of different housing types. And the two family um, by right um, or by site plan um, uh, that's moving forward is not size restricted. So that's an option um, that could um, provide housing that's more accessible to people. If it's, you know, if you're sharing a party wall or sharing a parcel with another um, unit and that is not size restricted. So that's, enough, that's an incentive to allow a different type of housing as well. Um, and then the um, other multifamily housing modifications that will be forthcoming related for downtown Florence and downtown Northampton would also not really have a size restriction. Um, but the idea behind 800 square feet was really to um, um, address uh, part of the market that we're not seeing, you know, we're, we're not seeing smaller units and there's sort of a disincentive to build those smaller units. So we know we need family housing. We know we need um, housing for people who don't have um, larger families. So we're trying to chip away at all those pieces. Um, and in terms of parking, Right now, the parking calculation is um, on a unit by unit basis and size. So for um, a unit that is a thousand square feet or smaller, one parking space is required. For any unit that has more than a thousand square feet of gross living area uh, requires two parking spaces. And we've, we don't require more than two parking spaces per unit. 
So um, the same would be applicable in the half scale units where in an 800 square foot unit would fall at that less than a thousand square feet. So it would require one parking space. So we're actually not proposing to make any modifications to the parking uh, requirements through this um, uh, change. Um, in terms of the tree replacement, um, the idea isn't to minimize the total, uh, necessarily dictate the footprint or where a project is being built and therefore adjust where the tree um, removal is taking place, but really look at the flip side and, and uh, or the other side of that equation, which is um, how many trees need to be replaced for the total being removed. And the way the language um, is before you, it does focus on um, where trees can't be replaced because it will, that when, it, when the tree grows, it will block solar access um, for uh, roof or ground mounted systems. So the way it says, it's, uh, the way it's written specifically is when significant trees on the property are cut, they should be replaced on site with new trees to the extent feasible without blocking um, solar photovoltaic or hot water systems. Um, so I think that would be the context in which the planning board would be evaluating whether or not trees could be planted in, you know, various locations on the property. Uh, Jane Myers, you had your hand up at one point, or you, you all set, or okay, I, I guess so. Uh, any other questions? Oh, Council Mayor, I'm sorry. Yes. You, That's okay. Uh, All I could find was the clap um, icon on every time every <laughs> meeting seems to change. So, um, uh, yeah, I just wanted to follow up. Well, actually, I had um, Member Taylor uh, to, to me Member Taylor's point. I mean, the, these um, the, the two family by right that would perhaps provide housing for families is not going to be subsidized. So that is a big difference in terms of who could afford to live there. Um, so I, I take member Taylor's point as a person with three kids in a too small house that we need more options at that level. Uh, but my question was about um, infrastructure. And I mean, I'm trying to picture the infrastructure, you know, so we've, how, how does it impact the, the city's infrastructure and, and, the, and the sewage, you know, the, the runoff and the sewage and all that when you, um, change up the units like that. I mean, I guess you've gone through it and you can kind of say with confidence that this is not gonna overload our, our current infrastructure. And then in Ward 7 with, of course, getting back to my concern about septic and well, I mean, it's not really a concern. I guess it's just a limitation. I'm trying to picture like if you had eight units, they wouldn't hell have tiny little septics and tiny little wells. I guess you just probably wouldn't do that project out here. Right. Well, so the half scale unit is applicable only in the urban residential B and urban residential oh, okay. C district. Yeah. Um, there are still cluster um, special permit uh, provisions that would um, could uh, result in a co sort of a cottage type or small cluster of um, detached units on a parcel in the um, you know, in Leeds or Ward Seven and Six, that's a different review process, and that's that would. Um, so at that point, then the evaluation of whether or not there's available water and sewer or septic and well um, would be um, undertaken. And in terms of the affordable house, I mean, all of these, any of these projects um, are contingent upon the uh, um, accessibility of water and sewer. I think if we're talking about replacing one large single family home with two smaller units, effectively, it's probably the same number of people that are occupying the space or perhaps even fewer people because single family homes um, might go much 
might be much bigger than 1600 square feet. So I think in, but in any of those scenarios, um, an evaluation of water and sewer availability is, um, is required as part of the building permit process. But no, we don't, we don't see overall the adding opportunities for housing, um, having um, a, um, an undue strain or stress on the um, capacity issues. Uh, we've, we've actually lost population, you know, over the last 20 years. So we're, um, it's not as though we're adding um, more than what the um, capacity uh, ability is for meeting that, those needs. Okay, thank you, Karen. Jane Myers, you're back. Can you unmute yourself? Let's see, let's see if you can get unmuted. There you go. Thank you. Hi, um, okay, I'm, I'm new at this issue, so I don't think these make sense, but a um, couple questions about the small housing. Um, Sam raised the question of parking and I'm thinking of the, the issue of uh, with four small dwellings on one larger lot, you know, uh, lot that might have been a single family house. What about any protection? There's no protection for any greenery or trees, right? In other words, a developer could come and make use of all every possible single space to have four separate uh, dwellings that and single dwellings, but there's no uh, restrictions on limiting greenery, right? Or on replacing greenery to change the character of that neighborhood which um, could also be an issue of sustainability. And um, it's one question. And um, the other question is, um, has there, again, out of my naivete, was there any talk about developing duplexes where a family could buy a house and then uh, maybe have more room for a family, but um, rent out the other part and get income. And that would also be very affordable, but I, that's as opposed to having their own, you know, very tiny, small, independent house. It would seem to be also more energy sustainable and more affordable to um, have a duplex that um, you just rent out and can pay for your house that way. I'll help pay for it. Just a question. Thank you. And then, uh, uh, Carolyn, go ahead. You got it. Um, so to, to answer the question about um, the developable area of a parcel, the open space setbacks um, height limits are not being proposed to be changed. So there are, for every district in the city, there are minimum requirements for maintaining areas that are not built on on each parcel. And the, structures need to be set back certain distances from property lines. So none of that would change. Um, the, uh, this configuration could be units within one structure under one roof, or they could be individual or, and detached units on a parcel. So it's not um, restricted to one uh, formula or another. Um, and uh, in terms of, um, and so also any of the, um, um, the, the tree replacement requirements under significant trees, which are defined as 20 inches or greater, um, would be applicable for any project that triggers site plan review. So none of those things are, are um, changing. Um, in terms of um, sharing a unit, uh, this is, again, this is part of a package of, of amendments. Uh, the previous uh, amendment, uh, proposed amendments that this committee reviewed related to um, two families. So two units on a parcel and without restrictions to size. And so that's moving forward as well. So um, that has been taken up by city council. They took their first vote on that on Thursday. Any other questions? Councilor Mayori. I'm forgetting whether the tree commission has, um, I know they reviewed the last, the two family by right. Um, have they been 
looking at these ordinances as well? Um, well, the only one that uh, affects, um, the only thing that relates to the, um, that speaks to trees, of course, um, which is not necessarily in their jurisdiction because it's zoning. Um, I believe that um, Rich Parcelletti looked at this, but I'm gonna have to defer to um, Wayne on that one. I'm not sure if um, he did or not, but we've talked at other, on other occasions, um, there's currently a waiver for a re tree replacement for um, uh, under um, the planning board's jurisdiction now for tree replacement uh, related to uh, trees over 20 inches. And the waiver allows um, applicants to go to the planning board and not replace all the trees um, on the property or elsewhere when um, affordable housing is being provided and uh, there's net zero um, um, homes being constructed and uh, also if there's open space um, or, or open space being um, provided to the city. So there is already a built-in provision for the planning board to um, waive tree replacement um, in this context. So this is just um, creating um, sort of a simpler path for the um, affordable housing developers to go through. So they know going in how to plan up front instead of having to come back at the back end and go back through a planning board special permit process. Um, this makes it a little bit more straightforward. Okay, thank you. <laughs> George. One more time. Um, sure. Carolyn, I, I want to make sure I understand the, the role or, or the, uh, the absence of a role on the part of the zoning board now. Um, I, I understand the whole intent of this new ordinance is to really streamline the application process for the large developers, Valley CDC or Wayfinders. Um, prior to this, when they had a, a large application a plan, they went to the zoning board for this comprehensive permitting. And then after they were done with the zoning board, or maybe at the same time, they'd come to the planning board for site plan approval and uh, or special permit. So the what we're doing now is basically taking this completely away from any zoning board purview and putting it just in this one stop at the planning board, which also of course involves the DPW and other departments. Um, but the zoning board now will, won't have any bite at the apple when it comes to these larger affordable housing um, development plans. Is that correct? Um, it's partially, but I want to clarify a couple of points. Um, currently under the 40B process, the state has set up that it, the permit applications go to the Zoning Board of Appeals because they're the appeals body um, that could, it's kind of like granting a variance. So the Zoning Board of Appeals is um, charged with um, the one-stop shop permit um, for any 40B projects. So um, the times in which you recall reviewing these 40B applications are really just um, deferential. The zoning board is not used to handling these uh, major uh, projects. It looks at all these details, stormwater, tree replacement, landscaping, access, um, lighting. So they're, they're require to um, send out the application to the other boards for feedback to help them make that decision. And they rely heavily on the planning board in that regard. Um, but the zoning board is the body that get grants all the permits. So any local wetlands review, any stormwater um, permit, um, any plan is any permit that would otherwise be a planning board. So it doesn't go for a separate permit to planning board for either site plan or special permit. It's okay. just one comprehensive permit for the zoning board. So in this case, it's really sort of relieving the zoning board of um, that comprehensive review 
which hasn't really been their strong suit anyway, looking at sort of big site plan issues okay. and giving that jurisdiction to the planning board. Can I just had one other thing too. Uh, sure. Sure. So, George, you're saying sort of changing from major projects. You should know we've been already, I mean, this work you're doing now is sort of, you know, six years into this process. So we've already moved a lot of projects out of re receiving a comprehensive permit. So any project in the central business district, so that's the lumber yard and 155 Live, any project in the state hospital, um, the project in Bridge Road, uh, Bridge Street last year, none of those required comprehensive permits. We've, we've created other provisions in zoning to get those there. So your comprehensive permits have generally been small projects like Habitat. I think the last significant one, I believe School Street was comprehensive permit. So they, comprehensive permits come up from time to time, but the really big projects you've seen have, a, have, have come through other provisions in zoning. Thank you. Uh, any other questions, comments, thoughts? So I'm gonna. Well, I, I mean, I guess. Yeah, I, Sam, go ahead. For whatever reason, I seem to I can clap. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm clapping too. Uh, it. <laughs> um, uh, so I, I guess I, I just asked Carolyn this question, but when I drive around Northampton, I don't I don't see that many parcels. Like, how big of an issue are we really even talking about here? I mean, how many, how many places are there that you could, that this really, that that like a large developer could could do this in 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 Northampton? Are you referring to both or the affordable housing one? The affordable, or... the, like the for like the yeah. small. I mean, obviously you could. I could buy any piece of property, you know, and tear down the house and build something there, but the, the cost doesn't make sense for, for that kind of project. And I'm just wondering, like, I mean, when you look at the maps of, of Northampton, I mean, how, how much of this, how many, how many, if we were to pass this, what kind of change is this really going to create? Um, it's, it's not, we're not assuming that it's just going to open up and all of a sudden, you know, Valley CDC is going to come in and, and um, start developing all these properties. Um, they, in fact, um, at the community resources meeting last week, um, Laura Baker noted that it's helpful for them because whenever they look at a project or a property and try to figure out what can they do on this property, mm -hmm. they run through the litany of options. You know, what are the regulatory paths that can get us to where we need to go? Um, and one of them is, is the 40B process, which, um, I think um, they will admit is not a friendly process and delays them quite a bit. So I think this allows them to take a more, um, an easier path through. But, you know, we're, we're so we're seeing projects, um, you know, affordable housing projects by affordable housing developers, maybe two small or three small ones a year, maybe one large one, you know, the largest one is Wayne, um, uh, noted was just was two years ago already the two happened to be on Pleasant Street right the wayfinders and lumberyard but um, so we don't think that this will all of a sudden allow a lot but it just allows you know marginal properties that maybe no one else is going to build on but it might be a great opportunity to put three or four affordable housing units on um, and it might even be the case that in areas that are lower zoned um, for lower density, where there might be leftover land where you couldn't put a single family home, um, you might be able to do two or three affordable housing units. And that allows sort of dispersed housing as well throughout the city. And I just give where a couple are. examples if I could. I mean, you know, so we have two projects my office is working on, the city owns. We have a small parcel on Burt's Pit Road that we got as part of the state hospital and a small parcel on Woodland Drive that we got for tax title. And we hope to do between the two parcels, a total of four affordable units. Our current path without this is two separate comprehensive permits, 
costing us probably close to $8,000 between the two and adding four months to the process. So not deadly, if this doesn't pass, we'll go for comprehensive permits, but that's a cost and that's the time we prefer not to do. Someday, those are the small end of the projects, like Carolyn was saying, individual things come up. Someday we assume that the nursing home on Bridge Road that's been on the market for a decade, not going anywhere because they're asking too much money, that that could well be a bigger affordable housing project. So that's sort of the range of, you know, nursing home being the big end and then not massive, but, you know, a lot of those things out there, there are two or three, so not a lot, but, you know, one or two of those a year. And I'm sorry, just one follow-up question. So I'm imagining uh, a, a property that's fairly, that's fairly large that someone puts up these small units on. Um, would, would you, in such a situation, because it's more of a condo property, allow for another, if it was on a corner, would you allow for um, another, another uh, driveway or in that situation? Well, all of the, all the rest of the zoning is still applicable. So okay. asking for second curb cuts triggers planning board review. So that would, um, the same, you know, okay. review standards would follow. So, so part of the, I mean, it's really, if you're a, um, a developer of affordable housing, um, it, your financing is very complicated. It's usually grant leveraged. You know, it requires unleveraged grants, timely grants, and anything that holds it up or threatens any one of it, those pieces, the financing could collapse. And we don't want to be an impediment to any of that. At the same time, still offering the same protections that, um, that, that the community comes to expect. Now, Carolyn, you know, this is kind of an expansion on Jenna's question because I'm anticipating the resistance of, I mean, I, 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 we don't, we're not getting any pushback now. I, I get the sense, I'm not going to predict, but I get the sense that there's, there's a general acceptance of this, of these proposals. Where we find the problem is, of course, implementation. When a project does actually present itself as an opportunity. I suspect that there will be neighborhood resistance. This doesn't, this wouldn't correspond with anyone's previous understanding of what their neighborhood looks like, because particularly the, the, the half size units too. Um, a series of half size units, there's nothing equivalent. So thereby someone would make the claim that of course, this is, does not conform with the integrity and the character of the neighborhood. The issue about trees, the issues, and. You know, I thought, you know, it should have come to it. Maybe we could consider something like a, a local carbon offset equivalent if, if all we're talking about is carbon sequestration, but we're also talking about screening and we're talking about shade trees and all the things that go with the, all the benefits that trees provide. So I, I, I'm just like to shake it out a little bit before we proceed with this because I'm all in favor, but I want us to realize, you know, in the end, um, you're talking to the two committees that are going to get the most heat when the first project is being proposed. So I, I just want us to be a little emotionally prepared for that. And maybe you can help us. <laughs> and, and, and that's open to you, Wayne, as well, and to uh, Solicitor Seawald, if you got thoughts on that too. So. so I'll add one thing, so more on the affordable housing side. Um, so in some ways, the incentive for neighbor to this approach is, remember today, if we do that money, if we do that time, we can do a comprehensive permit and the zoning board could, they don't have to, but the zoning board can waive any and all local regulations, local wetlands regulations, not state, wet, wet, not state regulations, DPW sewer hookup fees, anything that's a local cost. This is much more narrow. So the only thing the planning board will be authorized for is the greater density. So we're sort of giving up some of our tricks because this path is so much easier. Um, so that might give neighbors a little more comfort level of not horrible things happening. And that goes to the tree replacement as well. So right now the zoning board could say, no, you don't have to do any tree replacement. Um, so 
this path says, yeah, you got to do some, but we understand that you might not be able to do it all on site. And we don't want to burden you with that extra cost of paying into the fund if you can't do it on site. Alan, you're the five. I've been doing this for 35 years. And for 35 years, people have been resistant to change. But change has happened for 35 years, and we're all still doing okay. Point taken. Um, I appreciate that. <laughs> that's, that's pretty much how I feel. But and in fact, but it, yes, I, I think we're all cognizant of the fact that the, whatever offsets or accommodations we make, the neighborhood is not. No particular neighborhood is following this conversation now. And in fact, if you ask anyone in any neighborhood, I'm sure they'd all be in favor of, of, of uh, enhancing our affordability in the community and diversifying until such time that actually somebody's talking, running around with a tape measure or uh, and, and a surveying uh, equipment and suddenly attitudes change quickly about that. And I, you know, and I'm checking out, so it doesn't matter. I've, I've already, I've, I've been, I've been baked in a furnace of these, these conflicts for 20 some odd years now. I'm just trying to set the table a little bit for those of you who are going to commit for a little longer or should be committed <laughs> in some way. Anyway, Mr. Okay. Chair, may I also say that uh, I, I was baked in the cauldron of Amherst yes. for 18 years. That's true, and I've, I've been on the wrong side of. Uh, your solicitor uh, Seawald's representation a couple of times as well. Um, Melissa, go ahead. Thanks, Bill. Um, so, you know, you guys may have already done this. I know there's been a number of articles recently in the paper, uh, most recently the two family. Um, I've had a couple of people, um, as far as, you know, the general public not being, not tracking this conversation, of course they're not. And exactly what's gonna happen is exactly as you say. Is there a way, or maybe you already have, of summarizing this package of amendment, um, uh, you know, changes, amendments that are really being thought out, combined together, we're proving them and reviewing them one at a time um, but there's, there's a cohesiveness to the package. And I think a lot of people in Northampton, they will not remember it when somebody's walking around with a tape measure in their backyard. But I, you know, if there's a way to maybe take one of the diagrams that shows these packages that are coming through as a cohesive thought process, I think a lot of people would um, be receptive to understanding um, the thought process and the intention that's going into this to try and uh, provide alternate um, housing options for as many people as possible. Um, just a thought. Okay. Thanks. I, I do appreciate that. Actually, there was a bit of a dilemma that the planning and sustainability had an opportunity to say front load us with all of these things, which would be the equivalent of drinking from a very powerful fire hose. And, um, and, and we all be much older when it was done. And, and then trying to parse it out as to which ones to introduce first, because Melissa, absolutely, I was thinking about the same thing today was, you know, how much easier would this have been if it were part of a, a, a package because we had to keep alluding to it, that this is just one leg or one dimension of the whole process in order to reinforce the discussion. But then I realized that most of the people that we were talking to who were resistant anywhere who really weren't interested yeah. in that. Yeah. <laughs> in the end, that had nothing to do with <laughs> the price right. of beans, so. And, and, and I think the, the putting them through one at a time is smart because you, you, you aren't drinking through the fire hose. Um, but, you know, there's people out there like my parents, uh, you know, who, who love to read this stuff in the newspaper and understand how it really is a cohesive package, multiple amendments, um, even though they're only hearing about them one at a time. Yeah, might help something. I must say that Dory Brooks column helped contextualize things quite well yeah, for anyone definitely. who was willing to read that. And it, mm -hmm. I, I want to give her a special shout out for that. Yeah. Any, uh, um, we should probably consider closing the public hearing. Um, 
I, but I want to make sure everyone had an opportunity to speak or ask questions. Is anyone else interested in asking questions or following up? Uh, for the public's purposes, uh, depending on how the recommendations go on, and the vote on this, this will go before the council and there'll be another opportunity to speak there um, in, in public comment and also you are encouraged to reach out to any of the people you see here. Uh, you can you can email all the counselors. I prefer that just to spare the planning board members. Uh, you know, our pay grades just a tick higher, so that we should probably you should probably focus your comments and remarks to the counselors. Um, and our our emails are available at the city website northamptonmod.gov. Um, and Everything that you write is also included and folded into the public record just for the uh, for eternity memorialized. So uh, anyone want to make a motion? Move to close the hearing, public hearing. Second. Second by Councillor Thorpe. Uh, the motion was uh, Councillor Sharon. Any discussion on closing the public hearing? Laura, please call the roll. Councillor Dwight. Yes. Councillor Shara. Yes. Councillor Mayori. Yes. And Councillor Thorpe. Yes. Do we need to move in second to close our part? Yeah, I think, yeah, I think the uh, planning board needs, they signed on. So Laura, if you would call the members of the uh, planning board. Sure. Is there a separate motion and second needed for the planning board or just? I think, yes. Yes. <laughs> I, I so move. Second. Okay. Is that member Fowler the second? Who was the Krista Granat? Who was Jana? Jana. 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 Okay. 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 Let me get back up to the list here. Okay. Um, member Kohout. Yes. Member Elkins. Yes. Member Fowler. Yes. Member Granat. Yes. Member Taylor. Yes. Yeah. Member Tate. Yes. And Member White. Yes. I don't believe Member Whitehill has joined. So I think uh, don't think so. Okay. Don't see any evidence there. All right. So we're, the public hearing is closed. Now, the next thing is that on, on legislative matters on our agenda, we can vote on the recommendation for these if there is a motion to that effect. Move a positive recommendation on as a group of both ordinances. Second. Motions been made by Council Shero, seconded by Council Maori. Discussion on the recommendation. Laura, please call the roll. Councillor Dwight. Yes. Councillor Shara. Yes. Councillor Maori. Yes. And Councillor Thorpe. Yes. Okay. They move forward unamended to the council unanimously with a positive recommendation. Um, and George, I don't know, uh, does your body have any other business on your agenda today? No, I think we need to vote. We need to, again, we need to make a recommendation and move this on to the city council, both of these. That's about it. Come Thursday, about, Billy, uh, on Thursday, we're going to take over our other business minutes and applications and things like that. Yeah. Fair enough. Well, then I'll... I'll I'll leave you to it to call your vote. How's that? Sounds great. So I think we'll need a motion either to recommend or not to recommend both of these um, ordinances moving forward. I move that we recommend uh, to move forward both of these amendments. Second. Second. All right. Thank you. Um, any discussion? I have a real quick one that I should have asked before. I think the question that our city attorney brought up, Mr. Seawall, the clarification that in the second group about the small homes, the, uh, the clarification that these aren't individually owned, but they're uh, a group association or a condo association. And that's not in the language at all within that multifamily. Do you think, Carolyn, that needs to be specified in any way? No, there's not. I mean, it basically says that it's the whatever is allowed as a single unit 
could be two half scale or two family could be four half scale. So um, the same frontage and lot size requirement for one carries over for the other. Um, and that's the way it's drafted. I think it was just more a clarification that it's you're not um, this ordinance doesn't create a new standard for lot size and frontages um, for these units. Mr. Chair, if I, if I could clarify, um, I, I, um, Carolyn is correct. I just wanted to be clear that the planning board would not be faced with a request to divide these structures onto two separate parcels so that they could be separately owned in that way because it would create zoning nonconformities. With regard to how they're owned, whether they're owned um, by uh, one party and one is occupied and rented or both are rented, um, zoning cannot uh, regulate the form of ownership of properties. Uh, a two unit condominium is the same as a duplex uh, four unit condominium is same as you know four rented units. Uh, the form of ownership is not a zoning concern. Thank you. I, I, I think as uh, Councillor Dwight mentioned earlier, those are the kinds of questions that come up from neighbors when they see a kind of a multi-unit development like this that we often get at the planning board. Okay, um, and just before we move on, Jenna, do you feel okay with our resolution of the tree um, issue with that language full extent as possible? I, I mean, yes, as long as we're going into it with with uh, eyes open as Councillor Dwight sort of referenced. Um, I mean, I th we've always managed to get through it and I think make good recommendations, but just an acknowledgement that I think it will continue to be a little bit of uh, fuzzy. Great. Good. Um, good. Any other discussion from the planning board before we vote on the motion? All right, then uh, I'll give Laura a break and I'll call the roll. Um, so all those in favor of the motion, uh, Marissa Elkins. Yes, very much so. Jenna? Same. Krista? Yes. And Melissa? Yes. And Chris? Yes. And Sam, are you there? Yes. Okay, and the chair votes yes too, so it's unanimous. So that we are happy to move this forward to the city council to have their more august uh, hearings. <laughs> What a very generous description of what we do in council. <laughs> um, that is that we've exhausted the agenda um, for legislative matters. I could accept a motion to adjourn. Move to adjourn. Le move to adjourn legislative matters. Second. Okay. Motions made by Council Shara, seconded by Council Maori. Any discussion? No, you don't. Dis we can't discuss adjournment, so we'll just move on to the roll call. Councilor Dwight. Yes. Councillor Shara. Yes. Councillor Maori. Yes. And Councillor Thorpe. Yes. Thank you all very much. I've actually enjoyed these meetings, believe it or not, which gives you some indication of how exciting my life is. And I do appreciate our conversations. They've been engrossing and edifying. And it, I, you know, we're probably going to do it again. So looking forward to seeing you then. <laughs> I'm that we, we adjourn the planning yeah. board meeting. Do we need to okay. Is there a oh, second? Yeah, sorry, I second. I second. second by Jana. All right. Any no discussion. All those in favor. Um, let's go backwards this time. Uh Sam Taylor, adjourn. Yes. Melissa? Yes. And uh Chris Tate? Yes. And uh Jana. Yes. And Marissa. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much.